estamos eh, conectados. Eh, es para nosotros eh, un gran honor y un placer eh, tener eh, hoy aquí en este espacio virtual eh, a la doctora Reiko Tomí, quien está haciendo una serie de conferencias eh, virtuales en diferentes instituciones de México, eh, patrocinadas también y coorganizadas por Fundación Japón México, a quien agradecemos muchísimo por esta iniciativa y también por la posibilidad de tener virtualmente, aunque sea la profesora Tomí, eh, aquí en México. Eh, quisiera entonces, eh, antes de darle la palabra a la profesora Tomí, eh, cederle el espacio a la subdirectora de Fundación Japón México, Marie Sato, para que nos ofrezca unas eh, breves palabras de bienvenida. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. A nombre de la Fundación Japón en México, es un gran placer darles la bienvenida a todos ustedes en esta conferencia realizada en colaboración con el Centro de Estudios de Asia y África del Colegio de México. Agradezco al doctor Amaury García, director del Centro de Estudios, por todas las facilidades e interés en la organización de esta conferencia, así como a la doctora Sato Mimiura por su apoyo en la coordinación. Propiciar el intercambio intelectual es parte de nuestra misión como Fundación Japón y con el Colmex somos afortunados de tener una larga historia de colaboración en el área de los estudios sobre Japón. Para aquellos que no conocen a la Fundación Japón, nosotros somos una entidad especial, parte del gobierno de Japón, que difunde la cultura japonesa, promueve el aprendizaje del idioma japonés y propicia el diálogo. La conferencia que impartirá la doctora Tomi el día de hoy se suma a nuestros esfuerzos de acercar a académicos de gran relevancia, no solo a los estudiantes de la maestría en estudios eh, de Asia y África, sino al público en general interesado en conocer más de Japón y en este caso conocer más del arte japonés de la posguerra. Como subdirectora de la Fundación Japón, Espero que este primer acercamiento entre la doctor, doctora Tomi y los jóvenes estudiantes de esta institución sea muy enriquecedor para ahondar su conocimiento del arte japonés de los años 1960. Y espero que también sea una semilla para frutas, invitaciones e intercambios de la doctora con la institución. Disfruten de la presentación. Gracias. Muchas gracias a la subdirectora Sato por sus palabras y me eh, presentar muy brevemente eh, la doctora Tomi, que eh, decía, es eh, realmente eh, un gran gusto poder compartir con ella. La doctora Reiko Tomi es una investigadora y curadora independiente que se especializa en historia del arte japonés de posguerra. Después de recibir su doctorado en historia del arte norteamericano de posguerra en la Universidad de Texas en Austin, Trabajó en el Centro de Arte Contemporáneo Internacional, SICA, por sus siglas en inglés, donde desarrolló su primer proyecto, organizando el archivo personal para una exhibición de Yayoi Kusama. La primera retrospectiva de la obra de Kusama, realizada en 1989 en Nueva York, y que la doctora Tomi organizó con Alexandra Munro, contribuyó a la fama de nivel internacional de la artista japonesa. A partir de 1992, la doctora Tomi ha trabajado como investigadora independiente. Entre sus múltiples colaboraciones con Alexandra Munro, podemos citar la publicación del libro Japanese Art After 1945, Scream Against the Sky, que se enfoca en el arte japonés posterior a 1945. Desde 1992, la doctora Tomi ha colaborado con numerosas instituciones y académicos y tiene una larga historia de trabajo en curadurías de exhibiciones sobre arte japonés de posguerra, así como publicaciones diversas, tanto en eh, publicaciones periódicas como, eh, como en libros. Ha trabajado también de manera muy estrecha con importantes nombres en el mundo académico vinculado con el arte japonés de posguerra. Su primer libro monográfico, monográfico perdón, llamado Radicalism in the Wilderness, 
International Contemporaneity and the 1960s Art in Japan, fue publicado por la editorial MIT en el año 2016. El libro que eh, es altamente considerado por eh, la academia vinculada con la historia del arte japonesa, además recibió en el año 2017 el premio Modern, eh, Robert Motherwell y también en el año 2019 el libro sirvió de base para una exhibición muy importante sobre el mismo tema en colaboración con la Galería Yukie Camilla en la Japan Society eh, en Nueva York. La, el trabajo académico de la doctora Tomi eh, es eh, pues muy conocido a nivel internacional. Eh, en México ya ha tenido eh, varias sesiones en su ciclo de conferencias y pues yo prefiero pues, darle ahora eh, la palabra a ella para que nos eh, ofrezca su presentación del día de hoy. Professor Tomi, it's, uh, it's really an honor and a big pleasure to have you here virtually in Mexico. It's a shame that the pandemics uh, forced us to organize everything virtually, but we will be extremely happy to have you here. Our students are very excited of, of having you virtually at, here at Colegio de Mexico, and I will give you the whole floor for your talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. I'm so happy to be here, even virtually. Maybe virtual may be better uh, sometime. But anyway, let me share the screen to begin the, uh, the, my talk. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the title of my talk is A Test Tube of New Art, Naikwa and Rental Galleries in 60s Japan. In recent years, the idea of multiple modernisms has been increasingly accepted in world art history. The multiplicity of modernism means that each modernism in a given locale rooted, rooted in its own origins has developed not just visual, but also other material and intellectual expressions of modernity particular to this locale. However, this development did not take place in a self-contained space, such as Japan, for example, but was varyingly informed by an intersecting mix of internal and external situations. In other words, the development of modernism in each locale was underscored by its local situation and transnational or global encounters. Furthermore, these localized manifestations of modernism are enmeshed in a large transversal matrix of modernism, such as vernacular modernism and decolonial modernism. To recognize this is the starting point of the examination of multiple modernisms. Simply put, in order to study multiple modernisms, we need to factor both local or micro specificities and global or macro frameworks. This is easier said than done. In deciphering a given modernism, caution must be taken against the facile assumption of universality because macro is often equated with universal, which is frequently a tacit assimilation of Euro-America. This makes each local potentially fraught with locally situated landmines, if you will. In studying 60s art in Japan, such landmines are not few. Rental gallery or Akashi Garo is one such landmine in 60s Japan. In order to consider the rental gallery, let us begin with one unfortunate ex episode of stepping on landmine. In 1966, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, hereafter abbreviated as MoMA, presented the new Japanese painting and sculpture, an exhibition organized by its current, its curators, William S. Lieberman and Droshishi Miller. In the accompanying catalog, Lieberman outlined the art world in Japan based on his field research there. Although a part, good part of his observation is informative and not inaccurate, he is in retrospect failed to comprehend one locally specific situation. The relevant part is in the catalog is as follows. The average dealer merely sells facilities for one-shot exhibitions, which may last only six or seven days. 
he makes no effort to represent an individual artist nor to further his career. What Lieberman thought of as the average dealer was not an art dealer at all in the Euro-American sense, that is the owner of commercial gallery. But the Japanese average dealer was the owner of a rental gallery. It is not a mistake to say, as we will soon see, that rental galleries sell facilities for one-shot exhibitions, which may last only six or seven days. This is an accurate description of what rental galleries were and still are. However, he was apparently unaware of the vital role played by rental galleries in the evolution of new art in post-war Japan. If he had, he would have characterized these average dealers in such a negative light. With the benefit of hindsight, we can see that Riverman stepped on an art historical landmine. Nonetheless, Riverman was not entirely to blame. For those who lived through it, the decade of 60s was still a decade of Eurocentrism, a decade dominated by the Shingu modernism with a capital M. It was not until much later that the notion of this modernism was put through critical interrogation in art history and museums alike. After all, Lieberman was charged to survey the state of new painting and sculpture within the conventional parameters of modernism, which he apparently expected to find through visiting commercial galleries, a methodology tried and tested in New York, when he came to Japan for research in December 64. And not Lieberman, Japan saw an exciting development in new art like in New York propelled by radical artists who aspire to transcend the established norms of painting and sculpture. By the time Lieberman visited Japan, these artists had found their ideal habitat in the thriving scene of rental galleries, especially in Tokyo, as well as in extra gallery spaces like urban streets and sometimes remote landscapes that I call the wilderness. A few factors to consider in assessing Lieberman's Japanese research and exhibition. Conceptually, one's research method would have differed whether one places emphasis on which of the two, new, or painting and sculpture, where in painting and sculpture was significantly older practice than new art in 60s Japan. Institutionally, the exhibition project was not initiated by Lieberman or Miller, but the international program section engaged in cultural exchanges, as has been uncovered by Hiroko Ikegami through her archival research. The two curators merely followed the top-down decision despite their unwillingness, although they managed to put together a respectable roster of moderately progressive painters and sculptors. Ultimately, we also have to evaluate Lieberman's individual aesthetic orientations. Notably, in 65, following his visit in Japan, Lieberman was invited to serve as a juror for that year's Museum of Contemporary Art Nagaoka's award exhibition. The exhibition was competition among 15 artists, seven Americans recommended by Lieberman, and eight Japanese selected by the Japanese jurors. In the final round, Lieberman and Japanese jurors could not agree on who to pick between two finalists, Charles Himman or Takamatsujiro, and ended up with no grand prize winner. In the slide, you see Himman's works in center at the Nagaoka exhibition. Takamatsu presented his shadow series including a large work shown in the slide. These are Himan's canvases dating around 65 in MoMA's collection. He is a competent painter of a moderately decorative minimalism in the US. In contrast, Takamatsu's shadow series represented the cutting edge of what would be known as street art in Japan 
with a strongly conceptual approach, typical of Takamatsu. It might have been like comparing apples and oranges, but it is not hard to imagine Liberman firmly stood by with him on. In, a, in light of his rather conservative or middle of the road taste, it is not surprising if Lieberman wanted to focus on painting and sculpture rather than new in his first foray into Japanese art. Within these parameters, Lieberman and Miller demonstrated their capable hands. Still, even if Lieberman had become aware of a very local gallery situations that was totally unlike New York, I wonder if he could have dug deeper to understand its historical context. That is to say, in modern Japan, not just rental galleries, but rental spaces historically played an indispensable role in the formation of modernism. Indeed, without studying a variety of rental spaces, we cannot accurately understand the history of modernism in Japan since the late 19th century. If in the 60s, the move to the extra gallery spaces by younger artists was novel, many of them also heavily relied on the rental gallery. In this sense, their practice was an integral part of the legacy of modernism in Japan. Even the Japanese themselves, this fact could constitute an unexpected landmine. For example, Think of Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum inaugurated in 1926. It was only nominally a museum. It was constructed expressly to rent its spaces to annual salons hosted by art associations that drove the formation of modernism in tandem with a government sponsored salon. The Tokyo Metropolitan was never expected to function like MoMA a canonical museum in the Western sense that collects, studies, and exhibits work of art. Some may argue, see how behind Japan was. My intention of making this above point is far from it. Rather, I would like to point out that this kind of discourse of belatedness embodies nothing but an internalized Eurocentrism on the margin. This is precisely the landmine the Japanese too should be aware, lest they should step on it. My position is this, not just in art, but in many areas of human endeavors as non-Western regions imported and adapted the Western as the modern. Each region identified local concerns, divides local situations, and formulate and develop local expressions of modernity. In Japan, one of such local solutions was the rental gallery. Based on this and other similar historical facts, I'd like to propose to re-examine the foundation of our narrative framework in light of realities of, say, Japan, as well as other regions on the margin, like Mexico. Hypothetically speaking, hypothetically speaking, should there have been no Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum as a rental space in Japan, what shape had pre-war modernism and post-war contemporary art taken? Besides, rental spaces existed in post-war Japan, not just in the form of museum, but they were also available for short-term basic inside department stores as well as small galleries and no art spaces, including bookstores, art supply stores, and cafes. Rental galleries that proliferated in post-war Japan extended this local tradition. In post-war Japan, the number of rental galleries grew exponentially. According to the gallery directory in the inaugural issue of Vijutsu Nenkan, meaning Art Annual in 57, published to supplement the monthly magazine, Bijutsu Techo or Art Notebook. There were 34 listed galleries listed for Tokyo in that year. 
The number demonstrates Tokyo's undeniable centrality in comparison to 12 galleries listed for Osaka, Kyoto, and Nagoya combined. The 34 spaces in Tokyo represented a full spectrum of aesthetic positions from the more conventional yet ubiquitous yoga, Western style painting, and Nihonga, Japanese style painting, to the more novel and occasional Gendai Bijutsu contemporary art. 20 of 34 were rental galleries that catered to practitioners of yoga and Nihonga as well as contemporary artists. The status of rental gallery was indicated by the yen figures, mostly in the thousands, given in the column of daily rental fee. The column for rental period usually showed weekly slots, that is five to seven days. In the case of commercial gallery, the fee column would merely state either no rental, gallery curated, garo kikaku, or occasionally permanent display, josetsu. Another important data is the wall length, indicating the mainstay of these gallery exhibitions are painting. By the 64 edition of Art Annual, the total number of galleries in Tokyo grew to about 100. The banner year of contemporary art, 1964 saw the Yomiuri newspaper company deciding to terminate the Yomiuri independent exhibition, the announcement of which in January threw the realm of vanguard art into turmoil. By 64, as you can see, the gallery data is organized horizontally. The entries are organized according to the area, such as Ginza, Shinjuku, Nihonbashi, with easy to read map added area by area. Of these 100 or so spaces listed, rental galleries numbered 58, 12 of which explicitly stated that they also curated exhibitions. On this page, Sato and Ito galleries are also curating rental galleries. This represents a significant evolution of rental galleries in that, in that some rental spaces began to work with artists more closely to encourage their artistic progress. Customarily, a curated exhibition at a rental gallery means that the gallery would invite an artist to have a solo exhibition at this space. The invited artist could determine the show's contents just as they would at any other rental gallery, but usually free of charge. It should be noted that curated exhibition in all practicalities means no fees involved, diverging from the traditional sense of organized by a curator and such. In this sense, not only does the rental gallery system constitute the landmine in 60s Japan, but the working of the system itself also adds another layer to potential misunderstanding. Toward 1970, the year of the landmark international exhibition, Tokyo Biennale 1970, contemporary art was decisively mainstreamed and both commercial and rental gallery scenes steadily expanded. The number of spaces in Tokyo listed in the 1970 edition of Art Annual rose over 160, and just about half of them were rental galleries. Among them, 18 were also curating, including Akiyama, Sato, Runami, and Surugadai. With gallery curated exhibitions, the benefit was mutual. They enhance the standing of galleries among conventional rental galleries. For example, Sato Gallery was known for the discerning eye of Baba Akira, a painter hired to manage the space and carefully screen artists, even for rental shows. For artists, to be given a curated exhibition at the rental gallery accrued both financial and critical benefit. Financially, 
invited artists did not have to pay the one week's fee, which would amount to say to 20,000 yen at Sato or 30,000 yen at Runami in 64. These were considerable sums, especially for young struggling artists when the starting monthly wage of college graduates working for the national government was 18,000 to 19,000 yen. So the uh, monthly rental gallery, no, 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 I meant the weekly rental gallery fee is more than the first year wage of the uh, national government employee. Critically, short of being picked up by a commercial gallery, an almost impossible prospect for contemporary artists, it was a badge of honor because those rental galleries that curated exercise aesthetic judgment to select artists for their curated slots. Granted, support did not come in the form of representation as Lieberman would have expected. Still, by giving no fee ex exhibitions to, still, by giving no fee exhibitions to young and ambitious artists, rental gallery indeed helped them gain exposure and critical attention thereby further furthering their careers. In a sense, these rental galleries effectively functioned as a non-profit alternative spaces like those in your America that have supported contemporary artistic practices without formal representation. In the post-war history of rental galleries, two venues in Tokyo stands out. One is Takemiya Gallery, a space run by an art supply store. Takemiya curated its solo exhibition series based on recommendations from the revered art critic Takiguchi Shuzo, who expounded on the importance of solo exhibitions for emerging artists. Altogether, 208 exhibitions were presented from 1951 to 57 at Takemiya. The other was Naika Gallery, a short-lived space that existed from 63 to 67, known for its emphasis on experimentalism. From the beginning, it was indeed to be a short-term venture. The owner, Miyata Kunio, was then a medical student whose father, an internist, had recently passed away. Miyata needed a few more years of training before opening his own practice at the office he inherited from his late father. Nakanishi Natsuyuki, his childhood friend and a member of the group Hyred Center, advised him to open a rental gallery with a signage that advertised its specialty, Naika, meaning internal medicine. In fact, calling it Naika Gallery. The young Miata was an ardent advocate of experimentalism. The announcement for Naika's opening in 63 bears his gallery manifesto, which reads, rental gallery is a test tube, if you will, in which any can be, anything can be placed, which anybody can occupy and use at his will. It's a transparent and completely characterless space. Today, when the experiment spirit must be consciously emphasized, the rental gallery akin to a test tube will be immensely effective. If the need for an art movement in vivo is asserted, it does not follow that we need not experiment in vitro. In fact, to this goal, many test tubes, that is many rental galleries are needed. By the way, we can use a test tube as a single flower vase or even as a whiskey glass. A test, tube, a test tube functions as such only within the laboratory and only in the hand of an experimentalist with a clear intention. I sincerely hope that Nika Gallery will function precisely like a true test tube. No doubt, Miyata's friendship with Nakanishi made him aware of the lively vanguard senses, scenes, Unburdened by the need to make profit beyond paying the rent, 
Miyata genuinely found pleasure in witnessing the birth of new movements at his place and personally getting to know young artists of his generation. Naika's location was favorable, right in front of Shinbashi Station and on the western edge of the Ginza Gallery District. A single room with walls 18 meters long, Naika hosted an impressive list of 125 exhibitions from May 63 to February 66, as researched and documented by Miyata Yuka. A number of them immediately or subsequently entered the annals of 60s art in Japan. In the gallery guide in the art annual, Naika never listed itself as also curator, but Naika's modest but curated program in the true sense of the word was key to its advocacy of experimentation. Miyata began, began the curated program auspiciously by inviting Nakahara Yusuke, one of the so-called big three critics, to guest curate. It resulted in Room of Alibi in July 63, in which Nakahara brilliantly interpreted the latest tendency of anti-art, Hangeijutsu, by assembling ready-made based work by 10 artists. However, the mainstay of the gallery operation was the solo exhibition, attesting to his con concept of a test tube in which anything can be placed. Naika presented a broad spectrum of tendencies from abstraction to pop, from conceptualism to incest. Uh, a broad, base, broad spectrum of tendencies from abstraction to pop, from conceptualism to installation art. Some luminaries of new art, such as Hyred Center, Shinohara Ushio, and Matsuzawa Yutaka, are known to have been invited to show their work without fees. Knowing Naika's critical reputation, some others chose to show at Naika by booking their slots and paying their daily fees of 4,000 yen. However, with no financial record left, it is not easy to ascertain which exhibition was indeed invitational or not. Given Miyata's connection to Nakanishi Natsuyuki, it is not surprising to see more than 10 exhibitions of conceptualism, 15 to be precise, out of the total of 120 exhibitions. Nakanishi's collective Hyred Center had two exhibitions. One was their Six Mixer Plan in May 63, held before the formal opening of the gallery. The other was, the other was their historic Great Panorama exhibition in 64. To mount Great Panorama exhibition, Hyred Center closed the whole gallery on the exhibition's opening day. That it was also called closing event. And the group opened the gallery on the last day with a closing party. On, this, on December 64, Matsuzawa Yutaka also closed Naika Gallery, although there is no documentary photo of it. An empty exhibition in which no work was shown dates back to 58 when Yves Klein staged the so-called void at Iris Square Gallery in Paris. However, so long as actual closing of the gallery space is concerned, it began by Hyred Center and slightly later Matsuzawa Yutaka in 64, an important event in world art history. In the Western logic, the gallery is a site of commerce. Even with conceptualism, if one closes the gallery, the gallery could not conduct its business. All the more so, in order to critique the commodification of art, American artist Robert Burry closed three galleries in 69. In contrast, Nike is a container in which artists can put anything, that is, a total freedom zone. It then was utterly meaningless if an artist closed Nikkor 
for no good reason. In the case of Great Panorama Exhibition, according to the account of Akasegawa Genpei, a higher ed center member, just as his can of the universe inverted the relationship of inside and outside and contained the whole universe outside the can, Great Panorama Exhibition foregrounded the whole world outside the gallery at the group exhibit, group's exhibit. Matsuzawa's case is far more complicated, so I suggest you read my book. Uh, I very, uh, I, I explained it in detail. Topped with these two gallery closings, Naika is a treasure trove of conceptualism. Thanks to his friendship with Miyata, Nakanishi made it possible for his conceptualist friends of Hyred Center and Tokyo Fraxus to have solo exhibition at Naika. Yoko Ono was a returnee from New York and vital liaison to Fraxus and such vanguard composers as John Cage in New York. She staged seven one-day events at Naika. Izumi Tatsu was a, Izumi Tatsu joined Hyred Center after the group was formed. In his first contribution to NICOR in July 63, Izumi in effect officiated the former medical office as a gallery. Conscious of this fact, he used the gallery space itself as the subject of his, his exhibition events by placing captions on various fixtures in the room as in six fan for a ventilation fan. Miyata himself commented, it appears the gallery itself was a work and I was part of the work too. Izumi even organized a closing event of the exhibition, anticipating Hyred Center's closing party for great panorama exhibition. In December 63, Kubota Shigeko had her solo exhibition at Naika and soon after she left to join Fruxas in New York upon Namjoon Pike's advice. Through Kubota's exhibition titled First Love, Second Love may be best understood as a two-part conceptual installation work. An elaborated invitation she mailed out functions as an instruction for the gallery installation. A translucent sheet of paper overlaid on the invitation ticket bears a typewritten text that reads, make a floor with waste paper, which are all love letters to you. Spread a sheet of white cloth on the floor. Skin your lip by yourself. Kiss a man who has mustache in audience. She also prepared a handwritten CV a photo of herself making a metal sculpture in her yard, and three photographs, each showing a part of a metal sculpture laid on white paper or cloth, marked as first love, second love, and third love. These items are likely prepared for publicity purposes as this particular set was found in a green envelope. A uh, green envelope of Naika Gallery addressed to Miki Tamon, a then curator of the National Museum of Art, Tokyo. In her later account, Kubota explained how she made her installation at Naika, and you can see Kubota there uh, in her installation at Naika. She spread her old love letters over the floor, on which she made a mountain of used newspaper purchased from a ragman, covered it with a white sheet and placed an iron sculpture on top. So you can see the uh, sculpture, a long sculpture, I think, uh, iron sculpture there too. The viewer was supposed to climb the mountain to see the sculpture on top. In belief, she orchestrated a space to experience sculpture. Tone Yasunao was a member of Group Bongaku and friendly with Akasegawa. Tone taught Akasegawa how to compose a music by, by, by way of creating an event. 
Tone's solo exhibition in October 64 was Tone Prize exhibition, intended to critique the jury system of salons and competitive exhibitions. Contrary to the traditional jury selection, Tone gave away the namesake Tone Prize to all participants. While the invited jurors, his colleagues, determined our deeds based on their own criteria. Notably, Yoko Ono's prize was solely intended to a male artist, engendering a reverse sexism in spirit. On the first day of Tone exhibition, Naika Gallery was filled with entries to the competition. Among the entry was Hyred Center, who presented cleaning event, officially known as Be Clean, and campaign to promote cleanliness and order in the metropolitan area. The event involved cleaning the streets of the busy shopping districts of Ginza animated by Tokyo Olympic Games. Their irrelevant performance successfully won a Tone Prize. In this photograph by Hirata Minoru, we can see a signboard and armband. You can see the armband here, uh, along with the ribbon on the wall. It may not be an overstatement, that small as it may be, Naika Gallery was one of major platforms from which new art en en emerged in 60s Japan, along with the internationally famed Sogetsu Art Center, which was backed by the large cultural capital of the Flower Arrangement School that promoted the intermediate experiments. Small as it might have been, Naika enlivened the vanguard scenes as provocative as provocatively as Soget's Art Center. However, conceptualism was not the sole beneficiary of Naika Gallery. By far, no other artist of 60s Japan benefited from the existence of Naika than Shinohara Ushio. You can see Shinohara facing to us. Shinohara's significance in 60s art in Japan can be understood by the fact that he was among two Japanese finalists of, Naga, of the Nagaoka Contemporary 65 Prize Exhibition, along with Takamatsu Jiro. In this slide, Shinohara's very pop canvases can be seen next to Hinman's minimalist canvases. Complete opposite of the cerebral Takamatsu, an action-oriented Shinohara published a semi-autobiography, Avanga Road, in 68. His words of lived experiences intimate how local 60s Japan was. In the early 60s, when Shinohara was immersed in action art, his thinking went as follows. The spiritual freedom that arises from the rewardless act, Musho no Koi of Art with a capital A, Geijutsu, is nothing but a thing of the past. In front of an interviewer's microphone, a serious discussion of art is useless. He who loudly says something shocking wins. In front of a camera, he must not hesitate but start dancing naked. This idea propelled his signature practice of boxing painting and other action-based work from 1959 onward. Moving into 63, when Shinohara shifted from action art to pop art, he made another proclamation in avant-garde road, swinging to the opposite extreme. Inspired by the commercial, commercially successful pop art in New York, he decided to bring the age of galleries to Japan in the mid 60s. He wrote in Avangard Road as follows, entering an age of galleries. However, we will throw in our Avangard box that is a mon monster into a 2 dk apartment equipped with a co uh, Kotatsu heater. In return, we decided to receive plenty of dough. What, of, what kind of gallery? of uh, what kind of gallery did Shinohara talked about? Apparently, 
commercial galleries that would bring money to artists. Indeed, by the mid 60s, Tokyo began to see a small sign of market for contemporary art with a handful of commercial gallery, such as Tokyo, Minami, Nantenshin, and Aoki specializing in contemporary art. However, the reality of Japan vastly differed from that of New York. And if we examine Shinohara's chronology, another reality emerges. His heavy reliance on rental gallery. Between 63 and 65, the crucial period when he developed not one but two pop inflected cities, he had 10 solo exhibitions over this three year period, a stunning frequency in and, uh, in and of itself and all were held at rental galleries. Notably, eight of them were held at one venue, Nika Gallery, painted in green. Shinohara recalls how Miyata would give him an urgent call at the last minute, whenever he had a hole in his calendar. Not many artists could get ready for a solo exhibition at the moment's notice, let alone at this frequency. In retrospect, the successive opportunities for intensive production were the best support Shinohara received from Miyata. Igniting a fire of creativity in the artist, Naika enabled him to make a swift transition from his action phase and fully develop his pop styles. It first manifested in the series of imitation art beginning in 63, followed by another series, Oilan, starting in 64. Especially important was the ongoing exploration of the Oiran series. The artist is the first to admit his indebtedness to Naika, as he recalls. Before that, I had small shows at Naika Gallery. These tiny shows helped me grow. Hearing that means his first commercial gallery exhibition held in 66 at Tokyo Gallery. Under the title of Doll Festival, he made a splash with a number of large oil and works. The most spectacular was Doll Festival, consisting of three panels and, and as wide as four meters. Ironically, in 60s Japan, a gallery representation did not come free of charge either. Lieberman would be surprised to know. Yamamoto Takashi, the owner of Tokyo Gallery, tried to help him get some sales by producing silk screen prints from Doll Festival and a few other works, but nothing was sold from the exhibition itself. Thus, according to the gallery, he incurred a huge debt of 330,000 yen from transportation framing and opening expenses, which, is, which was more than $900 at the time, or about 10 weeks worth of rental gallery space. Tokyo Gallery took the largest painting doll festival in lieu of payment. The work was eventually sold to Yamamura Tokutaro, a collector known for his guitar collection, and it was subsequently acquired by the Hyogo Prefecture Museum or Hyogo Prefecture Museum of Art as part of the Yamamura collection. No greater support a gallery can give to an artist than to place his work in an institutional collection, even decades later. Tokyo Gallery went on to show Shinohara's works in group exhibitions and con continue to support him. Yet, in the late 60s, Shinohara saw no prospect for his career in Tokyo and moved to New York in 69 on a JDL third fund grant. It's a lock fella money. In New York, he cre his creativity and productivity continued to flourish to invent new works. The series of motorcycle sculpture and expansively ex an expansive body of vivid narrative-based paintings and drawing. As he gained critical attention in his, in his new home, 
he was given a solo exhibition at Japan House Gallery, which is now Japan Society Gallery in 82. In Tokyo, he established a lasting relationship with Gallery Yamaguchi in Tokyo in 81. Until the untimely death of the owner Yamaguchi Mitsuko in 2010, he continued to show with her. Notably, Gallery Yamaguchi was a new breed of also curating rental galleries in that it actively represented artists, primarily selling their works to public museums, whose number significantly increased since 1970. The foregoing is one key element of the evolutionary path that modernism in Japan took, situated in the locally specific conditions. Notably, the practice of artists and the concerns of institutions too evolved over years. It also makes a cautionary tale for study of multiple modernisms. Few practices are exactly what they look like or sound like, inextricably situated between the local and the global. All the more so, it is important to construct world art history from bottom up to narrate, not the universal story but a globally resonating story. Thank you, this is it. This is the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tumi. Uh, we are very happy of, of hearing you uh, and your talk today. And uh, then uh, I believe that we will begin with a Q&A session. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will uh, give uh, the floor to any question. I have I have also a question, but I will let my question to the end. I would prefer uh, um, participants could uh, ask their own questions. Eh, por favor, eh, pues agradecemos mucho la participación de la doctora Tomí en esta charla de hoy y abrimos a una sesión de preguntas y respuestas, ya sea para aquellos que están conectados aquí en Zoom como para aquellos otros que nos están siguiendo a través de Facebook Live. Pueden escribir sus, eh, sus preguntas en el chat de Facebook Live y nosotros eh, se las hacemos llegar a la profesora Tomí por aquí. ¿Alguna pregunta? tanto por la plataforma de Facebook como eh, por, eh, por aquí por Zoom. Janet, si hay alguna pregunta que no estoy viendo, también me, me puedes avisar, de favor. Claro que sí. Si nadie se anima para, para romper el hielo, pues si quieren hago la pregunta yo. Uh, well, I will then, if uh, there are, our participants are still hesitating to ask questions, so I will begin in order to break the ice. Yes. <laughs> it's Good okay idea. with you. Yes, of course, <laughs> of course. Okay. Um, in your talk today, and also as part of uh, your more general research interests, you address the Eurocentrism in which the main narrative of the history of modernism in art history is based and how studying specific development in Japan challenge that vision, as you say, as landmines. I am curious in knowing your opinion about how do you see this situation regarding the study of other periods of Japanese art history? Let's say, for example, what is called traditional arts, uh, the discipline itself, and even what is called today as uh, global art history. Do you think, is there a, also a need to rethink the historical narratives for the history of Japanese art or to offer alternate stories? That's a very important question, I think. Uh, the, uh, I always talk Eurocentrism uh, because actually my uh, American colleagues encouraged me to talk about it because when I wrote the book, I mean the draft, 
uh, the introductory chapter, which is a methodological, dis methodological discussion, I didn't really say that. I didn't use the word Eurocentrism. And then my American colleague said, why not? Because you are targeting it. And if so, you have to make the target very clear so that everybody knows what you are shooting at. So the, uh, that's uh, why I, I have no shame, even though Eurocentrism itself may be old, but it is still persistent. So I feel I have to talk about it. So thank you for asking about that. Uh, the Japan is an interesting place to look at Eurocentrism because Eurocentrism means, especially in the context of modernism, that in anything new, which is modernism basically by definition, originated in Europe or the West, you know, in a little broader sense. And then uh, that new thing was disseminated to the margins like uh, Mexico or Japan or Australia or wherever. And then those uh, marginal uh, regions imitated follow it and then uh, assimilated it and then tried to catch up with the West. So this uh, spread and disseminate and then uh, influence. This is the, the basic concept of Eurocentrism. What is interesting if you see at the events in post-war Japan is that the, uh, in, some, in some cases, we do have the reverse order of uh, episodes, like uh, the I talk about the uh, closing events today, and then uh, if merely really closing the gallery is the uh, you know what the, at stake. Uh, Sixty four is the first time that was done in avant garde art, and then uh, that was in Japan in sixty four. The next earliest was 69 by Robert Barry. Of course, the, uh, we can always talk about the crime, but he didn't really close it, he just emptied it. And then that's a completely different the conceptual, uh, you know, uh, the mechanism from the, uh, you know, closed gallery. So not that, you know, I'm gloating, uh, I'm gleeful that, you know, Japan was earlier than anybody else in closing the gallery. But you know, the thing is, maybe we studied more, we may find something like that, you know, somewhere else. So like, you know, it's very dangerous to be grateful about the, you know, being first. Being first is not important actually. Why they did that? And then what was the, uh, you know, goal? And then in what situation they did? That was more important than simply, uh, you know, uh, competing for the first. Uh, so the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the Alan Capro in the, uh, he was the pioneer, he's uh, considered pioneer of happenings, but the, uh, that was late fifties. And then he later learned that the Gutai was much earlier in doing action-based art and then I think he was a little upset, but he tried to create his own theory to make him look good. And then like that's because being fast was important. If new is important, being fast is very important. And then that's the situation of the 50s and 60s. So we, can, we shouldn't blame the artists. Uh, we, we should blame us if uh, we try to figure out who's first. But the, uh, so the, uh, by simple chronological facts, Japan actually already challenges Eurocentrism. And then also, not only Japan's, in some cases, early or about the same time, but you know, they came out of completely or very different circumstances, uh, cultural environment, social environment, historical environment. So the uh, so the uh, the the opening episode I put, the MoMA's curator didn't understand the rental gallery situation. That's really the reality of our cultural exchange. Mm. And then like, you know, you, we have to understand if I, uh, you know, you come to New Japan, 
where to go? There are so many art places and then you cannot just go anywhere. Just like you come to New York and then you cannot go to anywhere. You, there are places you want to go, places of new art and then, uh, uh, and then so on and so forth. Uh, you asked me about the traditional art. Uh, if we dial back just a little bit for pre-war, early part of 20th century, like uh, the, uh, the last fall, I think, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art had the uh, kind of global uh, view of uh, surrealism. And then there are Latin American, very strong uh, manifestation in Japan, China, and then uh, like, uh, you know, Central Europe and then so on and so forth. So the, uh, you know, we are not looking carefully. So the, uh, we have to start looking more carefully what was going on in the same method and the same lens to understand local condition, local expression, local operation. Now, tricky thing is if we go back further, like uh, it is a fact in the late 19th century, Japan had to import oil painting you know, the idea of oil painting, method of oil painting, and then how to paint it and so on and so forth, because we didn't have it. And then oil painting symbolized modern. So the like, you know, okay, so like, you know, if oil painting was modern, Japan was behind. So the Eurocentrism may seem to stand. But wait a second. There are lots of different way of looking at culture. For example, if we look at the botany, botany was very much advanced in Japan in the, uh, uh, the 18th century, I believe. And then uh, taxonomy was quite evolved uh, and then published in the uh, like uh, Woodbrook print, uh, Woodbrook book, I mean. When the, uh, uh, the Western botany imported in Japan in the late 19th century, Actually, it was easy to kind of match the two. We already had the uh, terminology for botany in Japanese, and then we have the counterpart in Latin language, Latin, uh, you know, linear system. So they actually kind of merged nicely. Unfortunately, because they merged, we forgot about our own tradition in botany. We think botany is Western thing. It didn't come from our own, but the, the reality is, you know, like it's coming from different places and then so on and so forth. Or uh, ukiyo-e, the Woodbrook print, which was uh, in uh, you know 18th and 19th century in Japan, it's a very popular, it's a mass culture, you know, mass culture, comp probably not comparable in other urban, uh, the urban, uh, uh, urban areas in the world, Be in part because the uh, like uh, liter uh, literacy was very high in Japan, and then so like uh, people read and then also enjoy the uh, you know like uh, the pictorial culture, and then that was cheap, and then for people uh, you know like a uh, common people and then samurai class, so that's a modernity already. So the uh, if even within modernity, kind of early modern part, like a modernity leading up to the uh, Western monopoly of modernism. It's a really interesting uh, situation. And furthermore, if we look at the Middle East and India or Egypt, that's where actually the West tapped their knowledge, uh, tapped their knowledge base to develop their modern medicine, modern mathematics, modern science. So the, uh, yes, I think we have to reconsider our narrative, uh, even going back to, I don't know how long, how, how far back we can go. Uh, my knowledge is not enough to say like a third century, but you know, like a 15th century, 14th century, easily we can go back. Thank you, thank you very much.
Uh, fortunately, we have now four or five questions. So okay. <laughs> that's great. Um, I will I will read them in order. Uh, we have the first one, uh, mm -hmm. and it's it it is wrote in Spanish. But uh, the question is, I would like to ask uh, how uh, the artist uh, Ono Yoko is considered in Japan. Uh, she uh, is so is she uh, considered with high steam in in Japan? Or the stigma that may affect all, or uh, his reputation uh, could be affected by uh, the vision of the West about her. Uh, the uh, Yoko Ono was highly respected in Japan. Yes, because the uh, we we uh, she is the uh, one of uh, four or five Japanese pioneers of conceptual art along with like a highlight center Kasegawa or Matsuzawa Yutaka you saw a little bit today. Um, then so the, uh, although the, uh, the difficulty was uh, in the 60s, she was not well understood. Uh, the definite uh, uh, gender bias was difficult. And uh, for her to practice freely, you know, she didn't have to worry about that in New York, whereas in Japan, it's a very strict, still very highly patriarchal society. However, you know, adversity, sometimes it's good for your art because cut piece may not have, might not have been born in New York. But it, it, it had to be born in Japan because at one point she went back to Japan in 62, as I said uh, in my uh, talk, and then like uh, uh, stay there in, uh, for two years. And then uh, she was actually practically told by male, I don't know if it's male crit critic or male artist or what kind of uh, male people, but the uh, women should sit tight, pretty, and silent. <laughs> so the, uh, she decided to sit tight, pretty, and silent on stage, during which time the audience was invited to come to the, uh, come to the stage and then uh, cut her crow, which became cut piece, a very important feminist manifestation of the uh, you know, conceptualism. Uh, she offered herself her clothes, Sunday clothes, to be cut and then uh, exposed to, you know, to the, uh, to, 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 uh, you know, to, to danger. So the, uh, there's always, uh, you know, situation that's difficult, but the, uh, overall she is very well, highly, highly respected, especially I think how work on peace movement uh, is something very, uh, you know, resonate with Japanese people. Thank you very much. I have uh, another question uh, by Professor Satomi Miura. Maybe she, she wrote the question, but I don't know if maybe she wants to ask the question uh, uh, by herself. Miura-sensei. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hey, thank you. My question is, how is the pandemic changing rental gallery's function? This is now. How uh, are so gallery is responding to the crisis? Uh, I see, I see, I see. Uh, the, uh, the rental gallery is still operating in Japan. I don't know how many right now. Uh, as my, uh, although there are so many commercial galleries uh, open. They are more or less following the government order or the uh, request of uh, uh, the prevent, uh, pre prevent, uh, prevent, preventive measures like uh, limiting uh, people coming in or the uh, you know wearing masks and then not having uh, opening parties and so on and so forth. So that's what I heard. Unfortunately, I'm I, I'm not there, so I really. Actually, don't know, but they are coping. And then sometimes, uh, you know, you have to uh, the public institutions like uh, you know, a big museum, big or small museums, 
they often the time had to close because it's too much to comprise so precisely to the uh, uh, the government regulations. The uh, often the time smaller galleries, I heard, uh, open and then um, in a very informal way, not the public way, but the informal way. So they are coping. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another question by Isabel Marrero. Isabel, maybe you also want to, uh, to address the question yourself? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Professor Tommy, for your talk. Hi. I will read my question. Uh, newspapers such as uh, Mainichi Shimbun and Yomiuri Shimbun used to finance Japan's participation in international exhibitions where official representation of Japanese art were exhibited. Did they also finance such alternative exhibitions as the one you mentioned in your talk, uh, which uh, broke with the status quo of Japanese art scene? If they did, um, what was the interest in this dual position towards Japanese uh, contemporary art? Thank you. Okay, so the uh, uh, your question is the uh, let me just yeah uh, the the connection was a little bad so I I, I had the difficulty uh, listening, but the Mainichi Omiru and Asahi they uh, are you asking they their international exhibition that they had in Japan or international exhibition they send out to abroad outside Japan, which you are to ask, asking me? Well, my question was um, more like they, they used to finance like official exhibitions mm -hmm. inside Japan, like, like Tokyo Biennale and so on, and outside like um, Japanese Pavilion Venice. Ah, Milan. yes, okay, okay, okay. So uh, did, and, they, uh, did they, sorry, did they also uh, used to finance like alternative Exhibitions? Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, so the uh, alternative is usually as opposed to mainstream or status quo or establishment. Uh, in the case of this exhibition, yes. So the Yomiuri, uh, uh, Yomiuri uh, uh, organized the independent exhibition since 49, 40, 49 to 64. That was not considered alternative because that was uh, cited at the museum, Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum. So that was the, uh, and the Yomiuri is a cultural capital, uh, the uh, major you know, daily newspaper company. So what they did was official. So the, uh, when the uh, Yomiuri had to terminate their independent exhibition, that was a shocking to the avant-garde artists because there was no official place they can go. And then that was the, uh, you know, not just the, uh, you know, uh, the museum exhibition, but that was the ex official exhibition. The interesting thing is the uh, Mainichi newspaper had the two biennales, uh, biennials. Uh, one is Tokyo uh, in, uh, Biennale uh, International Exhibition, and also they have domestic uh, biennale, biennial. They alternate the, uh, you know, every year, and then. Uh, Initially, it was mainly uh, uh, modernist, you know, oil painters and then uh, paint yoga and then uh, Nihonga and then like a conventional modern art. And then uh, Yomiuri kind of took care of the more, little more avant-garde or more ultra things. However, by 60, early 60s, the, uh, they began to change because the, uh, the engine, for the more conventional art was kind of uh, receding to the background because the uh, nothing new was, nothing really new was coming out. What's new was coming in, coming out uh, made by all these younger artists. And the younger artists were either showing at the independent exhibition or trying a small group exhibitions and so on and so forth. So interestingly, Mainichi started uh, the uh, competition section to which you can 
apply, submit, and then if you are good, you will be selected. So it is a little one rank above the, uh, uh, the in independent exhibition. Independent exhibition is anybody can show it. Even Sunday painter can show it so long as you pay the fee. So the, uh, the Mainichi as a, uh, the a cultural capital, another cultural capital, also began, uh, now began to look at younger artists in a more official capacity. And then that helped younger artists uh, more uh, avenues to explore. On top of that, there are three or four competitive exhibition, like a show prize exhibition, which is uh, sponsored by uh, the oil company, Shell Oil Company. And then uh, that encourage younger people, this is for younger people, you know, to uh, compete. And then the Vanguard artists actually did very well because the, uh, they are doing something new and then uh, that's appreciated. And then other competitive exhibition too. So the, uh, and then moreover, the, uh, the Museum of Modern Art Tokyo was uh, instituted in mid fifties and then uh, Kyoto, another uh, National Museum of Modern Art was uh, also uh, created in Kyoto in early 60s. And then they started looking at the, uh, the, the contemporary art too. So overall, the contemporary art or Gendai Bijutsu, which is uh, another name of uh, uh, avant-garde art in Japan, or the main level for avant-garde art in Japan in the 60s, uh, 60s and 70s, they became more official. I call it more mainstreamed. So did they become a part of mainstream culture? That is why Tokyo Biennale 1970, that's the uh, Mainichi's uh, you know, like, uh, exhibition was such a big deal. But the, uh, before that, like 68 to 69, 90, 70, the all alone, the uh, contemporary artists were doing extremely well. Furthermore, the 1970 was the year of Expo, Expo World Expo. And then for that, a massive number of uh, contemporary artists were mobilized to work with pavilions and then, uh, and then uh, like exhibitions and then uh, events. So the, if the contemporary art really became a part, a part of mainstream culture, public culture, even though if you ask uh, like a middle-aged woman or a salary man, what do you think of contemporary? They would say they don't understand. They would probably like oil painting or something like that. But the, uh, as a society, they, uh, you know, uh, uh, contemporary art became um, more mainstream. So the uh, rental gallery is actually an interesting position. It's not quite wilderness. It is a, a kind of, a, you know, the first step for contemporary artists to try uh, their, you know, art to show it to the public. The only problem is there are so many rental galleries only in Tokyo. If you go to regional cities, there are a few, of course, but not many. So the uh, Tokyo is still the center. And then, uh, the, uh, but the, uh, certainly rental gallery alternative, but the, uh, that because the mainstream of uh, contemporary art became so strong, alternative have to be also strong too. That is, that's a very interesting uh, coexistence, I think. Thank you very much. I have um, I have three uh, uh, other questions, but I will join two of them, uh, um, which I received them uh, from uh, Facebook. So um, it is um, in your opinion, which is the future of the rental galleries, and which kind of strategies are following the galleries in Japan 
in this era of virtual exhibitions? Ah, the, uh, actually, in, uh, I have to say rental gallery still exists, but not as a, no longer a driving force of contemporary art. The, so the, uh, they are still like, you know, demand for that, but the, uh, the, what changed after, okay, 1980s and 90s, the more commercial galleries uh, emerged for contemporary art. Some of them really working with international artists, some of them focusing on Japanese artists. So actually today, rental gallery is really on the margin of the art world because smaller commercial galleries are, you know, working pretty well. And then they are, uh, so the, uh, the landscape of contemporary changed com completely probably after 1980s. And then uh, it further changed because the, uh, at one point, uh, the, the public museums were good supporter of contemporary art from 1970 onward, because there was a construction boom of uh, modern museums in Japan from 1970 onward. So they, each prefecture has a modern museum or art museum, and even municipalities have uh, museums, contemporary or modern museums. So there are lots of, uh, you know, like a market for artists in terms of museum. And then they, they are eager to show contemporary art. The, uh, the problem is with the recession, uh, the uh, kicking in like uh, uh, bubble burst. Uh, so late nineties onward, Japan's economy declined. So that means the tax revenue declines. That means public museums budget declined. So the uh, now artists had to be a little more ingenious in uh, not just relying on museum, but the uh, kind of, again, do it yourself situation. So like uh, the project, community project, or the uh, like uh, art festivals. And those, are, those became the, uh, the important platforms for younger, as well as uh, you know, may, uh, the established contemporary artists. Uh, so for that, what gallery can do is the uh, 80s onward, Japanese galleries become more like New York galleries or Paris gallery. It, it becomes really galleries. So the, uh, the, that's why Japanese people may not understand the importance of rental gallery in the 50s and 60s because they practically don't matter right now in a big picture of the art world. Hmm. Thank you very much. I have a last question here yes. uh, from Iana Rojas, who is uh, connected with us here in Zoom. I don't know if Iliana wants to address the question directly or do you, do you prefer me to read it? So as you choose. Yeah, okay, I, I will address it uh, dire directly to Tommy Sensei. Uh, I was wondering about, uh, apart from rental galleries, which other important landmines had you find in the studying or under understanding CISTIS art in Japan? Ah, extremely provocative question. <laughs> there are lots of landmines. For example, the, uh, we talk, uh, we uh, uh, like uh, Matsuzawa Yutaka I showed today, he's a landmine, I think, because the, this is a landmine for Japanese people, because the, uh, his art was, his conceptualism was very difficult to understand. So the only recently uh, people began to understand, Japanese people began to understand much later than like, uh, you know, international world. So the interesting thing is like, uh, Eurocentrism affect 60s Japan a lot 
even though they are catching up and then you know, going ahead, you know, that's happening, but still the mentality, the consciousness is still, uh, you know, under the Eurocentrism. So when conceptual art emerged in Europe and America, it, we didn't know uh, the Japanese people didn't really know much about it, but it came to Japan in early 70s in full force. So the uh, suddenly people, Japanese people became aware of conceptual art. And then after the fact, oh, we seem to have something similar. He's also a conceptual artist too. And then by that time, the like, uh, what is conceptual art? Okay, conceptual art is about language. And then like, you know, they use language and then so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, Matsuzawa used language. So he must be also a conceptual artist. But the, uh, the uh, we never really care to examine where he came from. Like he's there already, so like okay, he's a Japan's a pioneer conceptualist. Period, and then that's actually a landmine, I think, because the our under appreciation of this artist Matsuzawa is based on the Western concept, not uh, according to what he did within Japanese situation, and then that's actually very one-sided very superficial understanding of an artist. So the, uh, that's like, for example, one uh, landmine. Thank you very much. Um, well, I don't see any more uh, questions. And uh, again, uh, Professor Tomi, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us and also for your enthusiasm in, in answering our call to organize all these activities. And I also would like to thank uh, again, uh, Japan Foundation Mexico for being behind uh, this series of talks. So for uh, this kind of Mexico tour uh, virtual and uh, let's hope the pandemics and many other things will align, we'll get a line in order to have you here in person in the near future. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. So, thank you very much to you. Thank you very much to uh, the ones connected in Zoom and the other audience who is following us in Facebook Live. Muchas gracias a todos y que tengan muy buenas noches y hasta la próxima. <laughs>